Ladies and gentlemen, it's that time again. It's time for the snob cast. Now, normally I'm joined by my much more handsome and smarter uh, partner in crime, Shay Simone. But this month, I'm very lucky. We finally got him, guys, to join us again. It's Schneider, James Schneider, my guy, joining me here this month. James, what's up, buddy? Hello, sir. Thanks for I, being here. I'm 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 very happy to be here. I'm very excited. It's I like to. We don't have a guest this month because uh, Shay canceled, and she had our guest this month as one of her friends coming by. So I let James pick the topic, and he, he chose a very interesting one today. By the way, guys, if you're not uh, aware, Shay's not dead. Uh, she's she's alive. working. Yes, yeah, she is alive. Well. She's working very hard on her comic books and a couple of books she's working on. She'll be back with us possibly next month to shoot this thing again. And, you know, she'll be back causing all the trouble that she normally causes. Uh, but this month, me and James are going to get into a little bit of trouble talking about who, James? That'd be Mr. Bond. You know, you know the guy. That's the right. The Walter that is, BK. That is correct. The reason Aston Martins sell for such a high price from the second that Eunice Gason said the famous quote, Trench, Sylvia Trench, and you are... We've had this super spy at our disposal for over 60 years, guys. It's 60 years this year that That's James right. Bond yeah. first hit our screens in 1962 with Dr. No. Unbelievable time for you to pick this topic. Actually, uh, James, perfect time. For you <laughs> I, uh, I just realized that, yes, it is indeed the 60th anniversary of Bond. That's, that's insane. And, and we're getting perspective of how much film itself is aging at this point, man. Like it's, it's a fairly new art form, but like we're getting some heavy anniversaries. Like, I mean, since the game had its 70th, 70th, like the other, like, like uh, 80th, bro. 80th. I, Last year. Yeah. So it's, I mean, uh, I just did a podcast and if you guys haven't heard it yet, I just did a podcast um, about a month and a half ago celebrating, I think it was the 15th anniversary of Zodiac. Yeah. 15 years of Zodiac. That's insane to me, right? <laughs> and like, uh, yeah, and uh, like all the decade-defining films of the 2010s are going to have their 10 years. Now, so. Yeah, I don't like to think about the fact that Inception is now over 10 years old. That's wow! Isn't that crazy? It could have come out yesterday, also. So it does. It, it just looks like it could have come out yesterday. That's what's amazing about age. it. Yeah. You know who doesn't age? Also, James Bond. James Bond. He ages like a fine wine. And let's talk about that. James. let's start with this who's your favorite james bond okay my favorite, this is a bit of a hot take um mine's timothy dalton is it because you resemble him with longer hair <laughs> uh yeah i i get a lot of james bond lookalike compliments and thank you but no i think he's he's what craig morphed into eventually He's kind of the grandfather to Craig's Bond, I think. I think he embodies Fleming's character from the books better than any of the Bonds. I mean, it's always a tie between him and Craig for me. But Dalton, there's just something about that steely look he gives and his line deliveries. And I mean, License to Kill has one of the best third acts but he's also in the living daylights and that's so that's a controversial yes. take <laughs> yeah it's also it's also one of those takes but yeah i mean he's he's my favorite one what about you Kyle? oh man the og my friend connery uh, sean connery yeah i love connery I have to rewatch some of his films yeah but he's he's he, i mean they're all they're all great there's really uh, you know, lazenby <laughs> <Lazenby. really> nobody <laughs> who <laughs> lazenby yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, that poor bastard got one movie and was like, "I'm out, guys." Peace out. I right, I'm gonna head out. One and done. And it wasn't a bad one. Lazenby's isn't that bad. No, it isn't. Yeah. And uh, one of the Craig films we're gonna talk about here in a second shows a lot of parallels with, with with that one. Oh no, no, get into that. Get into that, please. Oh, I mean, well, No Time to Die. Well, spoiler alert for 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 No Time to Die. I guess it was we're because we're gonna be talking about it because we're gonna be talking about Craig films. So I guess there are a lot of musical cues in No Time to Die that are similar to the ones in Majesty's Secret Service 
uh, Zimmer uses a lot of the same like motifs. And uh, the line we have all the time in the world, that's a recurring line that's, uh, that's used for great emotional impact, both in uh, Lazenby and Craig's films. Um, and in Craig's films, of course, like his eventual adios is a lot more uh, resounding because the thing that's unique about Craig's films is that unlike the other Bond actors that we've had, his films followed sort of a chronological story from point A to point B. And it wasn't really like a uh, anthology sort of storyline. Like you, you started with Casino Royale and you can just trace that line all the way there. Um, so yeah, Craig's stands out for that reason. I like that you brought up uh, Casino Royale too, because obviously Dr. No, the most famous scenes in the movie take place in a casino. Casino Royale's already been made. Gambling and casinos seem to be uh, a theme with James Bond, but he is sort of a gambler, isn't he? Every time he goes out there, he's a super spy, and he's 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 suave and he knows what's up. But what's kind of funny is that <laughs> they never really show him going through all the paperwork and the documents after he wins stuff. But because <laughs> I know for for some reason casinos, whenever you win things or whatever, it's like you gotta sign here and do it that way because you want it this way. It's well, I'll tell you, as the resident Las Vegan here, that's not exactly how that goes. Oh, it's not? Okay. I, I do, do tell. because You, I've been you, you win money, you cash your chips in, you go home. Okay, cool. They give you a ton of money. Yeah, all right. All right. I, 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 what if you win, like, a car? What if someone throws their keychain on the table and they say, hey, my car's on the line now? Nope, can't do that. That's not an actual thing that happens. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that only happens in the movies, and it only happens in James Van- Bond movies. So, yeah, yeah. no. That was, that, was, that was a slick scene with Casino Royale. But, yeah, I mean, Connery, and, and then, of course, there's, there's more who kind of, I mean, he's not bad at the beginning, but then he kind of flounders into, you know, Austin Powers. Dear God, he spoofs himself. Right. <laughs> he becomes Frowning. the caricature of himself and that's what that's what i think is so interesting about roger moore is he starts off so strong and then by the time you get to like thunderball you're like what the hell has just happened here yeah it's, what uh, has happened here and then uh what was the last one view to a kill a view to a kill yeah i can't live and let die is good <laughs> oh, yeah live and let die is great yeah yeah that introduced me to wings so but yeah, fucking it's... moonraker jesus christ yeah, Moonraker, I've watched that opening scene more times than I can remember. And even though I was little, I could still notice that the stunt doubles were pretty apparent there. In that yeah, but, you know, it's just one of those things, like, coming off of The Man with the Golden Gun, you know, and The Spy Who Loved Me, those are great, those are great Bond films. Oh, yeah. Moonraker had a lot to, to, to follow up with, and it just couldn't get the job done, unfortunately. Uh, now, and you're also forgetting Pierce Brosnan, who was my James Bond growing up as I was going through my, you know, formative years. I'll bet you played Goldeneye on the, the N64. Probably. You know damn well that I played it. <laughs> and the rules were, you know, flappers only, no odd job. Oh, my God. That's the rules. You got to you gotta Strict. melee your way to victory. Thank you very much. <laughs> and no odd job, you cheating bastards. <laughs> So I don't know if you know this, but Oddjob, because he's a, a little person, yeah. In the game, he had he had a glitch where no one could could hit him. Oh, you couldn't melee that's him. Fair. It's so unfair. Yeah, you so he <laughs> we outlawed him in my all of my gaming circles. He's uh, he's outlawed. Uh, it's nothing against little people, but you know. Yeah, well, yeah, that's yeah. It's bullshit. So yeah. let's start there. Let's start there. Let's start with Pierce Brosnan because I feel like that's they're going to lead perfectly into our main topic, which is going to be discussing these, uh, these Daniel Craig films. Brosnan is a tale of two halves. Indeed. You know, golden eye and tomorrow never dies and die. Another, you know, are good, but then die another day. And, uh, what's, I forget the other one. The world is not enough. There you go. Those are bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Two good ones and two really bad ones. And, and it's funny because, I think GoldenEye is really the only good one because even, you know, um, even the second, the, the follow-up has Denise Richards and that's a really cheesy movie. Yeah, it is quite cheesy. I mean, I, I feel like Bond at that point got to there. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's, 
he got off to I mean that opening scene Golden Eye was like the perfect start to 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 his Bond introduction. I believe it, was it Joseph Campbell who directed those? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Golden Eye. Yeah, I'm yeah. pretty sure. Joseph and Campbell he also did Golden Casino Royale. Eye. He's 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 started two Bond franchises. Yeah, he's perfectly. He's good at that though because the thing about him is he understands the character. The problem is once the character's established that's where it kind of doesn't it kind of flounders for me because like i said you look at golden eye you look at it's martin campbell um you look at martin, martin campbell, campbell um and the way that he does things he, he he did the same thing with zorro actually he did the mask of zorro also i feel like when he's got characters that he's building he's good at building characters but once the characters are built in front of him he has nothing nowhere to go with them uh i, I see what you mean so he's better with original concepts than he is with the follow-ups to those original concepts, if that makes sense. No, that, make, that makes total sense. I mean, you can start something off banger and then it can go a completely different direction. Um, and, uh, well, I mean, yeah, GoldenEye, I think, is just the most resounding one of the Bronson movies. I don't think a lot of people remember or, or, or sometimes care to remember the other ones. I mean, well, that's because the world is not enough, and die another day aren't any good. But tomorrow never dies is decent, and Goldeneye, of course, yeah. is a top fiver. It's amazing, top fiver. Sean, Sean Bean, dude, uh, that scene at the end when Sean Bean. <laughs> Spoiler <laughs> alert to a movie from 1995 when he dives yeah. off the thing. You can yeah. tell it's a dummy, but like I don't care. <laughs> it, it's I don't care. Go and see his body floating. And like you don't care because it's just so funny. The landing would look pretty brutal though. I mean, his arms like flop around and yeah, it's pretty yeah. insane. And, uh, and if I remember correctly, there's like an overhead shot of him like on the ground, right? Yeah, he's like yeah he's there, and then they do that. The, Dude, that's the, so the, cool. Thing. That's yeah, such a that, cool. Yeah, but I love I love the action in that because. That, especially that final scene because that was like the first taste of well not i mean the, not the first taste but to get into the more gritty action the more like movie star like, bond bruising you know blockbuster bond that we know today i mean it still was a blockbuster back then but not like the real blockbuster bond. um because with craig which we'll get into obviously but with craig he, he jumps all around a lot and he gets a lot of he gets he gets his hands dirty like in a really rough way and Brosnan, i was just gonna say that dude yeah perfect yeah like his because Brosnan in in that final fight you know he's he's against sean penny he, there, there's like these brutal like extensions of the human body that happen like when that ladder falls down and he's like hanging off of that the base of that antenna like it jerks in a way where you just wince and you're like jeez i'm feeling for this guy but like come on um but yeah, that's I love that type of action. And and Goldeneye, it's uh, that opening scene is just marvelous cinema, just in, in general. Like you wouldn't, I, if you showed it to someone, they wouldn't distinguish, you know, like the stunt double from from Pierce. Like they'd think like, oh my god, he did the whole thing. You know, it's I really well, I, I get you because, but to be honest with you, with you, being a stunt double for Pierce Brosnan can't be that bad, right? No. <laughs> you know, not, not that bad. Not, it's got to be pretty simple. Just yeah. look handsome and look handsome from afar. Yes, and be able to mama me. If but before we before we get to the next thing, I want to talk about the fact that Pierce Brosnan's still ridiculously handsome, especially looking at, in his Doctor Fate outfit. You guys saw that trailer Indeed. for Black Adam. I'm like, that guy's like 70 years old. He looks so good. It's not fair. He's, he he is balling. He he still yeah. has those uh, what are those, those blue collar jackets. Or like the button up, like striped little jackets. Because he's sixty nine years old, dude. I don't think you realize oh. that. Yeah, it's, it's but amazing. it's funny because he's Irish. Yeah, you know, and Lazenby's Australian. Obviously, Connery's Scottish. Dalton was the first. Well, no, because Dalton's uh from Wales, isn't he? He might be. I, I don't quite remember, but um, I'm gonna look this up because that's. Please do. I need to know this. Yeah, he's Welsh. I was right. Wow. And so Roger Moore was the first British uh, Bond. Yes. He, he would be. And then, of course. We didn't get a British Bond until our guy that has the spotlight tonight, Daniel Craig. 
that's yeah that's insane I, but i, mean, I feel like I, daniel craig is like the liverpool version of like pierce brosnan's more posh uh james bond yeah they all have their own identities don't they like uh craig sometimes has that that, that poshness but um he's he's very hardened and Brosnan is a lot more keen and like matter of fact and uh and then roger of course is the humbly bumble like oh hello Mm-hmm. And, and then uh, you have you have Dalton, who's like this suave and debonair type. And then yeah. you have your OG Connery, who's very like, like he mixes Brosnan and, and Craig a little bit, where he's a little rough behind, you know, rough around the edges, but he's still suave. Yeah, he's still got it. And um, say it was quite it was quite important. It will come up later. But well, let's uh, start with the first Craig movie. Let's talk yes. about that, which is Casino Royale. Yes, Casino freaking Royale, which revitalized a franchise. Yeah, it came out in two thousand six. Obviously, Martin Campbell comes back to direct it. This is the first. It was the first great Bond movie in a long time. It was, and it was after the the we must not speak of die another day it was 10 years from goldeneye man because goldeneye is 95 so it was about 10 years from goldeneye and you had this film come out and you had this rough around the edges rough and tumble james bond coming out there doing his thing what were your impressions of seeing it for the first time when you when you did see that i was i was moved i don't mean that like a super emotional way but it's um you know seeing action like i was I was always like a huge fan of like the, you know, the French connection and all the Indiana Jones movies, all those lovely action adventures films. And as a young lad watching Casino Royale, it was, um, it was a definite shift because I had seen most of the Bond films chronologically up until then. I, I ended on like Tomorrow Never Dies or something like that. And yeah, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. And um everyone was saying, like, oh, it's way too brutal. Like, oh, we don't like Daniel Craig. I'm like, I, I want to see him. I want to see him. So we saw Cine Royale on DVD. I actually have, you know what? But it up, but you can even just take a this will be the thumbnail. I still have it to this day. It's the uh card it is. It's, it's a cardboard. I still have the cardboard, like uh, it has the sleeve on it and everything. Look at sleeve this on guy. it. It even has the chance to win the vacation royale at Atlantis Paradise Island Bahamas. <laughs> it starts on the first of March of two thousand seven and ends on the thirtieth of April. So we're nearing that anniversary. But anyways, case in point is that it was shocking to see bond in such a different place than he'd been in the past because in this film we see him becoming james bond i mean his 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 name really isn't mentioned i mean all that much throughout the film and you never hear you know 007 or what i also thought was pretty ingenious is that you really don't hear his main theme until the very end you kind of kept that reveal uh hidden so to speak like if you should be upset yeah. Oh, really? How to make you upset? Was it just like, uh, I mean, I understand for all his big entrances and stuff like that, you could have, you know. That's what I wanted. I wanted that. Dun, 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 dun. I want that big entrance. Yeah. But we did get a hell of a gun barrel scene, that Chris Cornell song. Uh, uh, I love that Chris Cornell song in general. You know, my name is top five for me. And, and or maybe even number one for 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 bond themes because that is a banger of an open you rarely get to see bond in in, in, a, in a cold open like that i mean you rarely get to see that side of bond's character in that cold open the funny what? thing about that is honestly uh i did rank all of the daniel craig themes i did an article for a different website where I ranked all the Daniel Craig themes. And I think I had Cornell's at second or third. You probably had Skyfall first. Of course I did, because it's amazing. Yeah, yeah it is amazing. I, I, it's, it's a cross between that and you know my name for, for best. All I mean, time. Adele's amazing, but we'll talk about that in a minute. <laughs> we'll talk, yeah. Um, but yeah, this, um, 
I mean, huge backlash. Now that I now that I've researched it enough, I mean, there was huge backlash when when he was cast as like Bond. Everybody's like, oh, a Bond with blue hair, blue eyes, and blonde hair. Like, what? This is is this? Are you guys kidding? You're gonna dye his hair, right? You're gonna put in contact lenses, right? We can't have this. Um, and he to be fair, all the I mean, all the other ones have these steely blue, blue uh, brown eyes and you know dark hair, so yeah. it went against type. But I, you know, it it's it. it it was, that wasn't my biggest concern when he got the role. My biggest concern when he got the role was, dude, he's a little bit rougher than these other dudes. <laughs> he kind of yeah. has a different look to him. That would be like uh, Clive Owen getting it. That was a, They were very similar to me in the way that they look and the way that they are perceived, you know? And it, it's funny because, speaking of gambling, one of the best Clive Owen performances is in Croupier, which is on Tubi right now. If you guys haven't seen Croupier, it's amazing. <laughs> Shout out! I'm gonna I'm gonna go check it out. As a matter of fact, thank you for recommending. Do it. you know what a croupier is? I don't. It's the dealer at a roulette table. Uh, He's the guy that spins know. the wheel. Goodness. I, I you just learned something, but welcome. You know the, the Vegas beautiful. guy, of course, knows that one. You know. Yes, big uh, in Vegas. Look at you. So one of the biggest things for me, one of my favorite things about Casino Royale is is obviously Eva Green playing Vesper Lind. But you know she didn't have you know, she could have played whatever and he, as long as Eva Green's in it, I'm, I'm gonna watch. It. Yeah, you're. <laughs> yeah, she's um she's a uh, very alluring for sure. Her introduction scene is, is is very effective and it kind of turns the tables on what a Bond girl could then or or sorry could can be. Um, Much more than eye candy. That's what I loved about it. Yes, and um, it's funny that that she's. I mean, it's not funny, but it's interesting that she's actually like one of the core themes like throughout the whole Craig film series. I mean, she's referenced a lot and their whole character development is truly fascinating in that, I mean, you don't really see it coming throughout the entire film, but when she does do that whole betrayal uh, thingy, you know, and Craig has that moment and he, Pretty much thanks to Eva Green's Vesper, I don't think this Craig Bond would have been as, you know, memorable. Or sympathetic. Or sympathetic. I think she's a very huge part of that. So she's like the uh, the queen piece to the king chess piece. You know, I don't play chess. Yes, that's obvious. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> No, and then of course, Casino Royale has the distinct pleasure of having Matt Mickelson as the baddie in this one, and he's fucking amazing, dude. A range on that dude, you gotta love Matt. That chair scene, that that was painful for yeah. for, any, for any for any male to watch that. It's uh, yeah, it's tough. It's, it's a painful experience in general to, to watch anything happen to anybody's uh, ghibli bits like that. But uh, you know, it made again, it helped make this tough guy Daniel Craig seem sympathetic you know he's in a he's not in an advantageous position which james bond often is put in these situations but most of the time he gets out with ease this one you're like how the hell is he gonna get out of this for sure and, and that's, that's i genius. think yeah that's 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 something that, that every bond film should strive to do and but unfortunately a, a lot of action movies nowadays don't really do because it's oh we'll get to situations where it seemed impossible but somehow bond got out of it and it's not working because <laughs> specter's coming up here soon Oh yeah, Spectre. <laughs> uh, yeah, I um, I glossed over that. So yeah, I'm Mads freaking Mickelson. I love that guy. He's you you see him in that, and then you watch him in like another round. You're like, how can he have such range? Being something you absolutely hate, to someone you absolutely love watching. That's the funny thing about him, man. And I'm not a. I've never seen a Harry Potter movie. People don't know this about me. And I've never read a Harry Potter book. And I refuse to wow. watch the Fantastic Beast series because I don't care. No. But no them recasting them recasting the villain to Mads Mikkelsen is automatically going to make those movies better. I guarantee that. Hmm. Most 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 definitely. I mean, poor Johnny Depp, but it's a good replacement. I uh, love Johnny Depp, by the way. Yes, we love we love Mr. John. Now, so after that, in two years later, we got Mark Forster's uh, film in the series, which is probably this one of the weaker Bond entries ever, Quantum of yeah. Solace. Um, some of the better parts of that movie, though, um, Olga Kurolenko as the Bond girl, good. He's great. Yeah. Uh, Gemma Archerton is also in it. 
Yeah, he's uh he's uh Mr. No, no, not Mr. Green, the, the other guy. Um what's his name? Man, Come on, Archerton is is a woman. Oh. She plays Strawberry Fields. Oh, the redhead. Yeah. Yeah, she was she was pretty good too. And then of course David Harbour's also in this movie. Yes, David Harbour has a has a brief appearance, I think. Yes. And it's been, it's been a while since I've since I've seen uh, the, the biggest stuff. the biggest problem with this movie is that it's a bad there's a there's a weak villain. Yeah. It's, I mean, there's the whole plot about water and, you know, mm -hmm. going to save. A, I mean, if they made it more personal, like maybe have like, you know, the Bond girls like family tied to it and have like Bond helping out like a small village, like, you know, Temple of Doom style. I feel like that would have worked a lot better. But um, yeah. they try to make it like big scale, like the world's in danger because they're going to use. I don't, even, I don't even remember what the guy's motivation was. And I don't even remember the, the, the main villain. He's Dominic Green. Dominic Green. He's just quite unforgettable. I mean, yes. forgettable. Sorry. <laughs> the, I'll tell you what the biggest problem in this movie. What the, the biggest problem in this movie was the writing. And it's not a surprise when you see who wrote the movie. You know who wrote the movie? Who? Oh. Paul Haggis, the director of Crash. Oh, oh no. <laughs> okay. Well, that's, uh, that's, that's fine. We stand broke back mountain should have won best picture here on this podcast. Yes. Film I, I, I have yet to see, as a matter of fact. What are you doing, man? I don't know. Don't I'm tell people that. that. Don't tell people that. They're not gonna think you're not a professional. <laughs> what the hell, James? There's there's so much I haven't seen. James, I've, you can't I, tell I, I people. Just stop, I actually just stop talking. Um James, you can't tell people you haven't seen Broke Back Mountain. What the hell, man? I yeah. It's um, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna watch it this evening. Do you want to cry? Because it'll make you cry. I I am ready for, for a good cry. I don't Something think you're ready. To cry. Some solace that definitely made me do with its editing. Also, oh god, right? It's just such a it's it's like a it's like a spasm chicken. It's spasm phasm. It's a spasm yeah. fest. And 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 unfortunately, I mean, I'll check back to Casino Royale real quick. Sorry, but um, it's <laughs> Casino Royale. I mean. It came out in a time where, you know, Jason Bourne films were coming out yeah. and the whole hand to hand, you know, flashy close up, quick cut combat was coming into cinema. And it's well known nowadays that it's used to. Thanks, Paul speak. Greengrass. Yeah. Um, extreme, extreme, extreme. So when, of course, well, Casino Royale has, has fantastic editing and most of it's because it's, well, it's well choreographed and, blah, 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 and all that jazz. I think in Quantum, I think they did their best, but it's just cut back and forth so rapidly and so obnoxiously that... Did they do their best? Did they do their best? It's, it's just hard to follow. And especially when there's like guns being taken out of pockets and stuff like that, and it's dark and blurry and you don't know what the heck's going on. That Listen, everything just didn't serve anything. It, that's exactly the main problem, and I don't blame Mark Forrester here because he's a he's a brilliant director. I don't, I don't yeah. know if you've seen any of his other work, right? I I don't. I I might have Christopher been, Robin, the Kite Runner. The way uh, is that the Justin Gordon that one? Yeah. No. Uh, Stranger Than Fiction. Oh yeah, of course. Monsters Oops. Ball, Finding Neverland. Okay, I love Stranger Than Fiction. That's like freaking amazing. That, that's I love that movie. That's Mark Forrester. He's a great director. I don't love blame Mark him. Forrester. I don't blame him for the lack of success. However, this film is so bad that it set back the Bond series four years before we would get another film. Yeah, but it, those four it, years paid dividends because perhaps the best James Bond film of all time came out in 2012. And that is Skyfall, directed, of course, by the brilliant, fantastic, and amazing Sam Mendes, Mendes. and featuring the song Skyfall, which won the Oscar for Adele by Adele. And started the curse that if you write a song for a Bond film in the 21st century past 2010, you will win the Oscar. Yeah, we're going to get to that in a minute. Um, you already know <laughs> what I'm going to yell about. <sighs> I'll, so, I'll, I'll, no, so I'll be back with that in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> He's revving up. He's getting ready. 
you already know I'm re- I'm prepared to for a, I'm spoiling for a fight here. Um, I, I have to look up what year that was that uh, Spectre came out because I'm gonna kill someone. 2015. Yeah. Well, anyway, oh. back to Skyfall. Yes. <laughs> um, God, this movie's amazing. The opening scene of that film. I've watched it so many times. It's seared into my memory. It is. It is just absolute. Brilliant. And it has what, what what you wanted from Casino. You have that small little. Nah, nah. It steps into the frame. It's exactly. subtle. It's not like the gun barrel at the beginning. Like it's, it makes sense. And it was the perfect 50th anniversary, right? Because, you know, I mean, it was the perfect 50th anniversary celebration. And I think, it, like, yes. Um, it couldn't have been more timely, uh, especially because, well, I mean, <laughs> I understand what happened with quantum and salts i i I totally know the behind the scenes about how you know they they tried to get funding and the production costs were like through the roof it was was insane uh but craig hung on and we did like you said we got one of the best bond entries ever i would and i would argue the best quite frankly i I would agree with you it's the best because it it did the one thing it could and the last thing it can ever do, which was show a Bond character interpretation out of commission, worn, and in a Logan-esque style by having Bond beaten down, not with his wits about him, and in true harm's way and taking it, his character's roots to a completely different place. Uh, but one that's very effective because we learn a lot about his history, a lot about his uh, inner psyche in the century also. Um, and we see that Bond is, you know, a flawed human and he's not some superhero. And uh, it might, that response might sound generic, but for the time, it really hadn't been shown before. Like having an action hero, I mean, well, there's been various films that have done that but like a hero as big as james bond like you can't possibly see him you know with stubble bloodshot eyes missing bullet shots at a at a, at a mark sheet like you'd never I, see john mcclain emotionally speak on his feelings in any of the diehard movies so i get where you're coming from with that right this really did show that there's a heart behind a heartbeat behind the blood vessels of, of james bond and i think daniel Craig did such a freaking fantastic job of doing that however he gets the entire show stolen from him, doesn't he? Yes, he does. By Mr. Mr. Ratman. Mr. Silva himself. Mr. Silva, played by Javier Bardem. Javier Bardem. And then, of course, Naomi Harris is the um, Bond girl in this one. Yes. And I love that it's a black woman, finally. <laughs> um, because, you know, can't. There's, I'm beautiful women. there's beautiful women of all shapes, sizes, and colors, ladies and gentlemen. And they finally decided to give us a black Bond girl, and she's amazing. We'll get to that again later on because there's another one. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> another one. Uh, yeah, but dude, Silva, such a good villain, bro. His his motivations are spot on. That reveal at the end when we when we get to see what he truly is and who he truly is is oh, yeah. just unbelievable. It's not convoluted, and it's something I feel like Spectre tried to do a similar reveal, but they can't they 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 muddied the water far too much. And we'll get to that in a minute here, but Man, I what you mean there? Skyfall yeah. is so freaking good, man. Editing, top notch. The the script written by Neil Purvis is pretty close to perfect. It really is. The pacing is because you've got a, oh, yeah. a guy it's, like Sam Bendis. The pacing right. is just incredibly well done. It's 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 done in such a way that when you watch the film, it's like two hours and a half, and it doesn't feel like two hours and a half. Yeah, because every no. chase scene that comes like feels like a third act or like a third act chase scene. Like you're exactly first you go, you know, like the opening. Well, obviously it's the opening, you get the opening, but then you go to you know the subway chase. And it's like wow, like that's like the whole like set piece. And he goes up to you know whatever meeting they have. And there's that great scene where uh M played by Dame Judy Dench, love her, love her in that role, by the way. Love Never her. Did mention her introduction, Golden Eye. All the way up until now yes so 20 years, 20 20 years. years. um there's that where's there's that 
part where she recites this beautiful poem and you know the, the score is playing and it's just bond running through the streets of london and it's like probably encapsulates what 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 makes this movie so great or if you watch that clip you'd understand what makes it so great again also is the scope of how mendez shoots the film something he would later go on to utilize in his next film 1917 there it makes bond feel like a little fish in this huge pond and that's not something we ever got before you know what i mean because his confidence is still broken from you know all the stuff he's dealt with with Vesper, the stuff, you know, having to be in Quantum of Solace. <laughs> His confidence as a character is broken. <laughs> yeah. And we start this scene, you know, that, that opening scene, he's only this big in the frame. He's a tiny speck in a frame. And the film escalates and builds and builds and builds and builds. And, and with it, the ethos and pathos of James Bond builds also. Do you know what I mean? I know what you mean, and who could have done it better than Roger Deakins? No one. No I mean, one. When I mean, you couple I mean, a guy with the eye of Mendez, and you couple that with a man who understands how a frame works, like Roger Deakins, Sir Roger Deakins, Sir, there's no way this movie could have failed. And I think that Bond, this is, like I said, this might be my favorite Bond movie. Uh, it, that or Dr. No, because I just, I love Dr. No, because it's such yeah, a Dr. great Knows. character yeah. introduction. We love that. And also, I, I also like Goldfinger a lot, which is great. Goldfinger. Yes, I love that. The funny thing is, one of the word the, the only, the post, some of the posts, like the pre Craig songs are a little bit cheesy. Uh, uh, you know, Bond themes are cheesy, but obviously, Live and Let Die has one of the best ones because it's got Paul McCartney. Slaps. Paul McCartney. So good. Yeah. Love smacking that. you in the face but anyway back to silva being amazing Dear yeah god silva, right i mean he's i love how he's like just just this perfect contrast to to craig spawn he's what craig spawn would do if he were evil i don't know that sounds like really generic response <laughs> but he's like um i love the the the, the quote-unquote family dynamic here because silva's like the older brother who's grown up and understood about the harsh realities of life bond's still kind of like you know not struggling out of you know like the cuckoo's nest but he's like you know he's 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 on his way and m's like you know the mother figure and you got gareth um, who's like the mean uncle a stupid uncle who doesn't know how to make correct decisions <laughs> yeah and oh, then, great finds. yeah and the, yeah yeah <laughs> exactly um and what you're saying about that scene where where it's that big reveal i love that scene where it takes uh that mouthpiece out and you see like the horrors he was his cheek just moves down and it's so it just moves creepy so creepy and um do you think that was a jaws reference or am i uh i think you're reading a bit much into that but it may have been a, it may have been a subtle like a you know, like a wink pebble, a subtle pebble because you know? when i first saw it i thought like Mm, that's that's a similar like kind of thing like he's putting like teeth in and they're like eh, and it's like that eh. looks looks similar but um yeah I mean, so when you blow up parliament to start your movie <laughs> <laughs> i mean yeah, yeah. <laughs> the I other see. thing about this that i wanted to to kind of touch on, on you with you you mentioned that subway scene which has two of the best shots in the movie the scene where the subway goes up into the ground and then that final spot where the, the back end of the subway falls out and he goes and adjusts his cufflinks. Yep. If that's not a James Bond shot, nothing is. That is, yeah, that's <laughs> incredible, incredible, incredible. I love that. that he story. jumps between the two cars, lands, the <laughs> other part falls off, and he just adjusts his cufflinks like nothing just happened. Nothing just happened. <laughs> and but you know, it's it's such it's such a cool fuck. I could talk about Sky all goddamn day. It's such a cool fucking movie. It is a very cool fucking movie. And um, the last, also one of my favorite shots is, is the last scene uh, where Bond's on the rooftop overlooking London. It was like right? the first shot in the trailer. And it was like, like wow. And of course, the ending of, of Skyfall is like, you know, the return to form. Like, oh shit, we, we go into M's office for the first time in the Craig films. We get like the top secret folder and it's like, shit, we're warped back to, to, to where it all began. And it's like, damn. Little did we know that would be for better and for worse. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you, if you took the Craig films and made them a trilogy, that'd be a perfect trilogy cap rock. Like 
So you know yeah, what? well, it's got that sagging middle dragging it alongside, you know, like its balls are yeah. being hit. You've got the forward. middle. <laughs> you've got the middle sort of like Temple of Doom entry. And you got the Last Crusade, which is the best of the three at the very end. So, it's so good. It's, it's, so it's, good. it's very goddamn good. And now, the problem is, Skyfall is technically the middle point of this trilogy, which is, is so funny uh, because Craig's films go, good one, bad one, great one, one. and now we're here at Spectre in 2015. <laughs> the first Skyfall one returned. I almost saw in theaters. I did see this one in theaters. All right, good. Well, um, look at that. And I wanted to scream at the screen afterwards. <laughs> Sam Mendes returns, for better okay. or worse. I mean, what do you think of the opening scene here? Because I, I was just going to say, it's the best scene in the movie, is the opening. It's, it's really good. I really love that. Like the whole, like, like the, like the debt, what was the quote that appears at the beginning? It's like the, the debt. What they seen is, is, is incredible. Yeah, it's amazing. It, it's very, it's very somber. And it's very, very like, what is it? Uh, not, not dark, but foreboding. Cause you get yes. like, bond, like in this skeleton, like costume, like, Oh, it's like, is that foreshadowing for something or, or what? Um, and it's a great setup and you get like that great intro with, uh, you know, the, the, the tracking shot, obviously, you know, that's a trademark right there. The, the, the interesting thing about Spectre is it's the best, it, it shows some of the best stuff that Bond can be and some of the worst things that Bond has been. Yeah. I mean, cinematography, you've got Hoytima on Hoytima, who, who's, who's a great cinematographer, but he is trying to mimic a lot of Bond, and he's not really embracing like his own sort if of. If he had done his thing, I think this may have been, been a better looking film, even because it's still a good looking film, but. Yeah, it is. You know, I, I just think John Logan's script is a little weaker than what we got from the previous film. Mendez is still doing his thing. He's still making, you know, making moves and 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 getting the most out he, that he can out of everyone here. I mean, yeah. except for one guy, and we'll get into that in a minute. This is our our introduction into Madeleine, uh, played by Leah Sedu, who is uh, going to be a key character coming up in the next movie as well. Very. Um, and of course, the Bond girl, the oldest Bond girl that we've ever had. Monica Bellucci's Lucia, looking she was so fine. She was, she was, yeah, she was, she was, she was great. I love so her. fine. It was very nice. Yes, and then of course Naomi Harris returns as well. Yes, she's amazing. Oh, yeah. to, see, to see them interact on screen was 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 very alluring for sure. But what uh, I love is there's there's moments in this that are good, like that scene we just talked about. The opening's good, but problem is there's too many scenes like the airplane chase, which is very much straight out of Pierce Brosnan. Where the, yeah. the airplane chases them through the um the forest and they're in the back of that that jeep. Yes, that's very much like a Pierce Brosnan jump the shark moment for me, and I, it takes me out of it. And then they're like, "Oh yeah, hey Batista, go fight him on a train." That's very you know from Russia with love, dope ass scene. Definitely a from Russia with love throwback, but also a throwback to sky to Skyfall a little bit because again subway train only yeah. one, you know one's above ground, one's underground. That scene's incredible, right? Yeah, I love that. But the problem here is the guy who's overacting in every scene that he's in, and it's Chris Stofwald. He's the problem with this movie. And he would have been, I mean, if you think of on paper, it sounds really great. Like, Christoph Wells is a Bond villain. He's Blofeld? Of all the Blofeld? Bond villains? Like, yeah, like, that's great. That should work. He's like, um, he's like his character in The Green Hornet. He's, he's chewing so much scenery. I don't know how he had time for catering. It's <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, it's am I wrong here though? No, no, no. You I mean, and uh, it's hard because it's not it's not good at points it's like the film itself like sometimes it's subtle and it's really great but sometimes it's like way too theatric which can be a double-edged sword for a bond film like it could be great like you could be like overacting but and one of the biggest other problems is sure the song by sam smith is good oh but it's not best original song that year good and it's not even the song i would have picked for uh for specter i would have gone with radiohead's Spectre. Afterwards. First of all, I don't like Radiohead, so oh. I don't care. Okay. You and Shay are both Radiohead stands, and I am Jay. 
the you, opposite. I know you love Spectre as much as I do, the Radiohead one. Shout out so, to you. You both love Spectre so much, and I just, I, or I'm sorry, uh, Radiohead so much, and I just can't do it. I can't, yeah. I can't. It it's, makes me want to pull my hair out. No, I, I'll say that, you know, the Sam Smith theme, it, it was good-ish. It seems unfortunate, though, because... It's now set a trend for Bond songs that I hope does not continue. Again, we're going to get to that in a minute. <laughs> I am so excited because I have so much to unload on that. I am as pissed as you are. But while we're unloading, uh, let me talk about Leah Sadu. She's amazing in this movie. She's, She's great. fantastic. Love She's her. Great. She's Love her as an actress. Love the her. The best, uh, you know, if we didn't have Vesper, I'd say she's the best in the Craig trilogy because Vesper's so good. Oh, but she's sizzling. I think that Madeline has so much lasting effects on the overall arc of James Bond as character. I mean, he was going to give it all up for that. Yeah. I mean, you know? pa- she's passionate. She's, she's husky. He has this husky voice. That's just very attractive. And she's French. And, and she's <laughs> French, which is a plus plus. It is. Um, funnily enough, I'd actually seen her in Blue is the Warmest Color before the James Bond film. So when I saw we all her, have. whoa, she's there. Look at that. And I'm, I just couldn't be happier that she can play that role because I don't really see anybody else doing it. Like, I, I could maybe have seen... You know what? I'm not even going to say it. She's, she plays it perfectly. <laughs> she's great. And she's great in everything. I just watched a movie called France that she was in where she plays this, like, reporter. Yes, I still want to see that. It looks, it's, it looks... it's incredibly good. It's, she's great in it. Um, you know, she was in uh, The French Dispatch. She's one of the best parts of that movie, which I did not like. Um... <laughs> Wes Anderson. I love Wes Anderson. Didn't like that movie. I, I thought it was him. Bond I thought song. it was him sucking his own dick for an hour and a half. It's a lot of directors have their moments where they do that. P.T. Anderson, I'm looking at you, buddy. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. That's uh, yeah. And what, what what was I gonna say? Oh yeah. Imagine a James Bond flick directed by Wes Anderson. Oh god, I don't want to. Imagine that. Like James with the- Bond would have like a pastel pink suit. Of the Alexandre Displot like quirky theme playing. <laughs> That's what it would sound like. And with like a like an out of tune trumpet playing the main theme. Uh, fucking random moog. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? A random <laughs> moog sound playing out of nowhere. What the fuck was that? <laughs> what the hell was that crap? Wes Anderson should, should just keep making his movies and never touch anybody else's. So have the Bond girl look directly into his eyes and speak just rapidly four paragraphs of dialogue. Because that's, that's and, not his problem. Yeah, he would just be like <laughs> up to here. I really just believe. And then do it in three different languages for no apparent reason. <laughs> Welcome to the French Dispatch. Come with me. We have to go. Okay, let's go. Montage. Bicycle. And they're all on bicycles for some reason. They're all on bicycles. No cars. All bicycles. That's and, the Wes Anderson. And, it has to be in a 4 3 aspect ratio. Every single time. I'm like, does he not believe in rectangles? <laughs> otherwise, otherwise, we're going nowhere. It has to be that. I hate that. And even if it could be in black and white. There you go. God, I hate it so much. Okay. Uh, but what he has to do is amazing and pretty yeah. much everything. Bruce Warmest Color. She's great. Uh, I love that movie. For, for sure. Various and things. she was in Glorious Bastards for, for a small bit of time. She's but good in it, though. It was a lasting impact. And of course, uh, Mr. Waltz was also in Glorious Bastards, so he was. They got to meet each other again on different terms. Yes, and, much um, worse terms than Inglorious Bastards. Great movie. Much worse terms, and it's been a while since I've seen Spectre. Maybe you can go check it out. Like, Don't rewatch it. It's, it makes me sad. I have. I, yeah, I'm. I'm not. I did watch a few scenes before hopping on. I will tell you the. I love that James Bond still does traditional movie intros with the credits rolling and you know the yeah. really cool effects. I love that. Yeah, I and love that. that. Writing on the walls works in that sense that it works within the movie, but you don't want to listen to writing on the walls the way you want to listen to Skyfall, not watching the movie. Right. Yeah. Writing on the walls like the perfect image, like it's the visual poem song. You want to listen to it while you're waiting for the bus, especially at the end when he hits the. Yeah. You didn't think I could oh, good. Hit it. good. Yeah, you, you did hit that. So, wow. Look at you. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, you know, and, and 
I saw this scene where it's actually a pretty good scene. It's the one between uh, Mr. White. I had to say that. Sorry. Uh, it's between Mr. White and um, and Bond. It's in, when they're in the, the, the basement of, of his house and it's like, you're a kite dancing in a hurricane, Mr. Bond. Like that line so haunting. Chills. That's just because of the way Jasper Christensen delivers it, Ed, though. He's, it's, he's so good. He's fantastic. And I love that, like, that little tie back to Casino Royale. I love that. Because he's, he's in Casino Royale, too, people. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I know, but it's cool to see, like, that. And, well, of course, we get the revelation that, um, that Madeline is, is his daughter. And it kind of makes it a little strange in retrospect yeah. uh, after having known them, which is a, 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 a little, little tiny little detail with the script. One of two. The other one was that was it revealed that Blofeld was James's adoptive brother? Is yeah, that, pretty much. Don't is get that me the main end of that movie? He wanders through a house at the end, trying to save Madeline, and it's a bunch of pictures with. Past There's just songs. like pictures and newspapers and things everywhere. And he says, like. Did he reveal it then and there, or was it earlier? I can't remember. I think it's actually, there's that standoff scene at the end where the two of them are, like, across from each yeah. other, and I think that's where it is. Okay. But I don't remember, but I just remember blocking out the ending of that movie because I was so irate <laughs> at the fact that Chris Dahl I mean, was terrible we, in that movie. We did get um, one of the largest explosions in film history, Inspector, though, and they yeah. did it in one take. Well, I, I should I was, hope so. Uh, that was that was Sam Mendes is good at blowing shit up. Yeah, he does. He, yeah, both 1917. Yeah, both on screen with explosives and and with the image. He, he blows it. He water. also blew up his marriage with Kate Winslet. Which how did you screw that up, my guy? <laughs> That's a queen right there. I mean, he did he didn't he direct uh, Revolution of Good? Yes. Yeah. And American uh, American Beauty. Oh well. That's yeah, that speaks for itself. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> uh, so yeah, I mean, it's been a. Uh, I mean, he's 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 a really great director, and he is. It's, it's um, at the end of the day, he did a phenomenal job with with Spectre and, and, and Casino Royale in direction, the story itself. Could have gone on in the of a better direction and uh after that we got one of the longest waits for a new bond flick in a six a while, years I think. like that six. was that was a good amount of time it, it should have been five years but obviously the pandemic set that film back uh what? you know quite a lot um but carrie joe fukunaga who directed the next movie which is no time to die learned from sam mendez's mistake and brought back Neil Purvis to write No Time to Die, who also wrote Skyfall. And so what you have in No Time to Die is technically a spiritual successor to Skyfall. I like to imagine Spectre doesn't exist. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, I'd, I'd say if you, if, you'd to, if you skipped over Spectre, um, you might, I mean, you might have, you might be able to capture what, what, what's going on in No Time to Die and not have like, you know, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't want to. Carrie Joey, Carrie Joji Fukunaga yeah. is this fucking talented director, man. Love him. Like Love everything him. he does, Maniac was good. Uh, Beasts of No Nation. Oh, he did hang on, Detective. Hang on. Freaking! I'm gonna turn off my background for a second. I see that. I see that. Oh. I see that Maniac. There it is. I love yep. it. I have the freaking physical copy of Maniac. <laughs> For your Emmy consideration, it's still on Netflix, guys. Just go watch that. Yeah, you guys don't have to purchase a physical copy of it, but I'm a physical maniac, so. Me too. Oh, I didn't. Yeah, I mean, you've seen some of the things I got sent this award season. Crazy. Right? Oh, freaking hell! Will Will got the stash. I will say. There's something I got to tell you about later on. Actually, uh, okay. that's funny you mentioned that. Uh, so, Beast of No Nation. He did True Detective season one, which is probably the greatest season of television I've ever seen. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Uh, he did that Jane Eyre adaptation, which is really fun, with Mia Wasikowska, which is oh, really was... good. And then oh, he did one of my favorite Spanish language films of all time, Sin Nombre. Sin Nombre. He directed a Spanish film. Really? Yeah, well, technically it's Honduran, Mexican, Salvadorian. 
production. Okay. You know, as a Salvadorian, who, I do that? appreciate. Yes. And it was uh, written by him as well. And the producers on it were Gael Garcia Bernal and Diego Luna. Oh, shit. Yeah. Wow. Have you ever seen Sin Nombre? I have not seen Sin Nombre. It's but, about uh, a young Honduran girl and a, uh, and a Mexican gangster who try to get to the American border. Wow. I'm going to check it out. Dude, I, especially because so of those producers. I mean, you've got Itu, the stars of Itu Mamá también on there. And two of my favorite Spanish actors. I love Gael Garcia Bernal. I used to get compared to him a lot when I was younger. I used to get told I look like him a lot. I'm like, I will take that because he is handsome. Take that. And, you know, I love Diego Luna because he's Diego Luna. Freaking Diego Luna. Love him. Yeah, Cassie and Andor. What's up, guys? What's up? Love Cassie and Andor. Andor man. gang. Guy. And so, the thing yeah. about it is, Carrie Joe Fuginaria, he's such a good director, man. Like, he just understands how to build and craft characters. And I think that's one of the strongest strengths of No Time to Die is he took all the best parts of what James Bond was in the previous two films, particularly the previous two films, because they more directly correlate and he just exacerbated all those things that made them a great tie-up to that series Absolutely. what you got yeah he, he i you couldn't have said it better i mean as i stated in the beginning he capped it off in a way that served craig's bond because they crafted craig's story in a way to where it was a chronological you know sequence of events and it did have to have a conclusion at one point it's, you do know who helped uh, you know who helped write this film with neil purvis right it was uh phoebe yeah uh, phoebe waller bridge yeah yeah she she helped it out and i think the script is, is really great in this i mean i'm not gonna complain uh What's that Hans zimmer score though the hom zimmer score is one of the best bond scores i've heard in a while in here what do you think of Linus Sandgren's uh, cinematography on that? On oh, No Time to Die? Yeah. Yeah, it's, um, I really love the sequences that are shot in film. Uh, I well, know. You, you know his back catalog, right? He's a fucking incredible cinematographer, dude. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I just watched the other day. I don't want to be that guy, but I am going to have to be that guy. I'm that guy through the entire show. I don't know if you know that. Uh, okay. Uh, so and grand oh my goodness is he's a yeah uh swedish guy yeah where guy's is a stud, he? man guys a stud he did don't look up i know that was don't look up he did first man which is a beautiful film he did yes. la la land which is there, there he is. Eyes. that was the one yes so he's 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 a fantastic cinematographer and for the sequences like an imax like in the beginning when they have that main chase sequence, mm-hmm. it was very well filmed. Love the colors popping. I would, this film's very colorful. Great color palette. But that's what Linus does. That's what Linus Sangren does. He, he injects color, but not to an extent that it distracts the eye. Exactly. Just, uh, the, the point of focus is never lost by at his additions of color. Because everything is... I, I feel like he hypes up the, uh, the saturation, too. He does. You know what I mean? You can see that in the in the in the opening scene more than anything. You can see like if if you're to take a picture of of anything and you hype up the saturation, a lot more details start to come out. And when Bond's like dirtied and like after being almost like half blown up, you can see yeah. the details on his face a whole lot more because of because of that increased saturation. And Daniel Craig's old as shit, so he has a lot of wrinkles on that face. Yes. And I'm surprised, like he's still Brings it home. I, I think this is next to Skyfall. It's probably his best, you know, outing as uh, it is as as Bond because it is he. It's the it's the most emotional one probably out of the out of the out of the four, or sorry, the five. Anna de Armas is good in it too. Anna de Armas is so freaking fantastic. She's good in everything. She's the she has come completely out of nowhere and she's gonna take everybody by storm she wasn't out of nowhere she was in a little movie called knock knock with keanu reese a few years ago and i called it then and my review yeah she's the best part of this worst this bad movie yeah i I mean like like she hasn't been around for 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 that long no it's true obviously leah sadu comes back i love lashana lynch uh his introduction is nomi i love her she's a great actress yes she was great. And, and a lot of people were like, oh, she's just going to steal the show. She's a credit. badass, dude. Yeah. she's. What's wrong with her stealing the show, though, you know? 
If she is the new 007, that would make perfect sense, like, within that world. It's a woman, uh, and she's black. That's amazing. It's amazing. Represent. That's amazing. Excellent. I love it. I hated the villain, though. Safin. Yes. yes. Rami Malek. I hate Rami Malek's acting. It's unfortunate because 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 Rami Malek he can play unnerving and, and calculating very well because I'm I'm currently watching Mr. Robot and he is very good at the show, but to have him as a Bond villain, we've seen him in so many roles where he's a likable character or a relatable character. Not maybe so much with Mr. Robot, but. In terms of Bohemian Rhapsody, I think that whole blowover really dampened his 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 impactfulness as well. Yeah, Bond. I'd agree with you, James. I would, dude. Because you know he was Freddie Mercury, and now he's gonna be you know the next big bad. Um, he's especially dampened for me because my first impression of him was when I saw him in Short Term Twelve, uh, one of the best before they were famous indie pictures. Ever made. Everyone's in that movie, dude. Everyone is freaking <laughs> in that movie. And, the Keith Stanfield, Brie Larson, John, yeah, uh, John S. Gallagher's in it. Yeah, uh, and freaking, I mean, Destiny Daniel Carton is a director. He's now done Shang Chi, which is pretty. Britain good. is such it's a good, good fucking director, dude. We God love damn. him. Graduated from SDSU. South Dakota State. No, San Diego State University. <laughs> <laughs> Death. Um, I once had somebody tell me that a- ASU meant Arkansas State. I'm like, in what goddamn reality does ASU mean Arkansas State? Go Devils, baby. <laughs> Go Devils. Uh, you didn't yeah. know it was a Sun Devil, did you? No. I, was, I, went to, I went to Arizona State, yeah. Hell yeah, dude. <laughs> Hell yeah. But uh, yeah, so final outing uh, as Craig, and I saw this in the theater. It was a very special occasion. Uh, it was one of those occasions, I was like, you know what? We need to go to the movies. Like, you ever feel like that? Like, you're like, I need to go see a film. Yep. Like, I need to go watch a movie. I feel like that all the time. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's not because of, like, you know, like, oh, I want to see it because I don't want to get spoiled or I want to see this because, you know, it's, like, my favorite thing. I just want to go, like, go to the movie theater and have, like, a good time. I'm going to so, tell you a really dark story when you finish the story about that. Okay. Please do. Because it'll contrast with this enlightening story I'm about to tell. Um, and this will tell those who are who are who are listening, uh, majority or 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 minority, that this picture it really solidifies how good Craig's Bond is. Um, I went to see No Time to Die with my mom. We both went, and she hates Daniel Craig's Bond. Like, she is not a fan. Her favorite Bond is Roger Moore. She loves the goofy-ass, you know, Austin Powers. She likes Sean Connery to me, but she's, she's more down to, like, you know, the lighthearted, adventurous Bond. Mm-hmm. That's kind of, like, you know, protected by plot armor all the time and, you know, doesn't really have that. That plot and armor be thick, though. It is quite thick. It's dummy thick. And in No Time to Die, it's, it's not as thick. Like, No Time to Die, throughout the film, it had real consequences. First of all, at the beginning, we got that little flashback to Casino Royale, and she kind of recognized, like, oh, shit, that's Vesper. I'm like, yeah, that's Vesper. So, and then we get one of the great performances in a supporting role in the Bond flick, both in Casino Royale and here. Uh, Jeffrey Wright is Phoenix Leiter. He's fantabulous. Love his character, and I love how his death added so much more weight to the story, because he's such a lovable guy, and you know him from Casino Royale brother from from the cia or fbi or wherever he was working for and um throughout the film you get these increasingly impactful consequences and, and circumstances and by the very end of course we we realize well well shit i mean madeline is probably going to be the closest thing to james's final like love he has their daughter essentially with them it's gotten a lot more personal and we go through the whole, you know, sequence where fantastic one shot sequence, by the way, where Bond goes up the staircase, shooting off bad guys who are coming out of nowhere. And it's just like complete like insanity. Um, 
his final fight with Safin, anticlimactic, yeah. Oh, and underwhelming is the better word for that. Underwhelming, yeah, probably. But it is brutal as 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 you know what it is. You can say the word here. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm scarred from 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 not being able to swear in interviews. Um, it's it's brutal. It's brutal as shit. So basically. At the very end, when, when we when we see that you know Bond sacrifices himself to to save the world, which I know it might sound, I've been saying this a lot, it might sound generic, it might sound cliche, but it is effective when done right. Um, that scene had me tearing up insanely, to and and an, an absurd amount, streaming down my face. I look over, my mom's in the same room. And when the credits started rolling, when that Louis Armstrong theme started playing, she looked over me and she said, James, I take back everything I said about Daniel Craig. That's the first time a James Bond film has moved me like that. That is not just a good James Bond film. That is a film. That's a film, James. I'm like, I told you so. So it's a really good one. And I could talk about that third act. It's just way too goddamn long, James. For hours. It is It is long. I'd say rewatchability factor. You'll have Zero. some means that, yeah, slug it down. Two hours and 43 minutes is too goddamn long to spend with James Bond, my friend. You can cut 20 minutes. Yes. Well, when you're watching it for the first time, I think the part of it dragging out actually does help, though, because you think, oh, shit, is he going to get out of You here? should just cut out all 20 minutes of Saffin is in. Because he's a terrible yeah. villain. Yeah, Safin. Thing about Safin, he's just another guy who wants to help control the world, the world. Uh, and control the world. And we've already seen a lot of those guys, and, and he has facial scars. And it's like see, a- Silva. Silva's was personal. Do you know what yeah. I mean? You ever watch like Criminal Minds, and they're like, obviously, this person knew the victim. They stabbed him forty-seven times, and it was really hard. Yeah, that's Silva. Whereas it's like, oh, this guy's a serial killer. He was just killing for pleasure. There's 17 wounds. None of them were too particularly deep, but they were, you know, cut in such a way. That's that's Safin. It's not as personal as Silva, who's this dirty, disgusting creep of a villain that you just you, you understand his his intents, but you don't. You wish he wasn't right. Right. You know. That's what it should strive to be, and uh, or sort of Safin it fell a little short. It and- did, and, and it's unfortunate because the movie around him. It's good. It is quite good. It's quite good. But it made our I, top I, 10 of 2021 thanks to James's very high voting. Yes. Gave it gave it a very high score because it did it, just because of that theater experience. And um, yeah, freaking amazing. But what was your dark story? I want to hear you. So your dark we were talking story. about how sometimes you just want to go see a movie. I was in a dark place, uh, you know, personally, and, you know, contemplate, you know, having thoughts and dark thoughts and things like that and one day i was just like i just need to i skipped work and i went to the movies I just thought, good, I'm gonna good on you, man. go see a movie and yeah. i went to see shazam shazam not the best movie right it's okay but the feeling it gave me of knowing like i am alive and i get to watch film because i am alive reinvigorated me and and, and kept me going you know what i mean when i was in a dark place i was like damn dude i this is not the best movie i've ever seen but damn dude i laughed a lot and that's what movies can do man that's the power of even a mediocre film sometimes david s sandberg shout out to you my friends one of the few uh who can turn hearts yeah it's just so good man it's it's so good and while we're talking about no time to die let's talk about the big elephant in the room here the the 94th oscars Okay, might as well. Might as well. No I... time to die. <laughs> Written by Billy Eilish, William Eilish's, and, and, and Phineas Cecil Connell's. The Ferb. Uh, beat some fantastic competition, uh, including "Be Alive" by Beyonce, which I wasn't going to pick. "Down to Joy" by Van Morrison. Somehow you do by Diane Warren from a, um, the funny thing is that's a mediocre movie for good days. We'll get into that in a minute. And the movie I the the, the song I thought should have won my favorite song from an incredible 
animated film by the name of Encanto, Dos Orellitas, which I thought was the best song in that movie. Encanto is amazing. And I totally understand your reaction. And I, I was going to ask you, what did you think of Billy Eilish's opening theme for No Time to Die before we get into it? I think it's good. And I think it's better than some, but it's not, it's not better than Dos Orellitas is as a song. For sure. I you agree know? with you. And it's not like they couldn't have nominated two songs from Encanto because you, you could have. It, it, we, we've done it before. Yes. And whatever happened to Ties? I mean, remember what I was talking about? Ties? Anymore, man. Nah, man, they don't happen anymore. Get I mean, that. that's like an old, like it's never happened before. Like, also, do you know how I know that they can nominate two movies from the same movie or two songs from the same movie? Because they did it in 2016. Oh, yeah. With um, La La Land, right? Mm -hmm. Audition got a nomination and City of Stars won. Wow. Yeah, that was a blowout in 2016 for sure. But that was, that was probably the final year in which the Oscars were, you know, like fun to watch. Yeah, I mean, well, they're still know. kind of fun to watch just in general. I mean, but, we uh, got we we had a bar fight break out in the middle of them this year, so yeah, for sure, dude. But you know, I have I have a point about uh, about Billy Eilish, and um, I love I love her music. I love I like what she does. I, I respect what she does. Go ahead and speak to us about William Eilish's sleepy music. <laughs> sleepy music. Um, I think I think she's she's revolutionized a lot of a lot of parts of you know how music is made today by by young artists um unfortunately i'm seeing a trend where a lot of copycatters of her um you mean like every every teenage uh artist that's coming out now and trying to emulate that board sound yes yeah, and that's I think what we're getting a, yeah i think it's a double-edged sword like she inspired a lot of people but at the same time we're getting stuff like that so it happens every generation, man. Madonna did the same thing. There was copy oh, yes. copycats and clones of Madonna all the time, everywhere. Kurt Cobain did it. There were he started the entire, you know, for all intents and purposes, the, the entire grunge movement. You know, uh, it happens all the time. Uh, you look at my generation. Uh, Gerard Way and My Chemical Romance started the makeup, the emo makeup, you know, scene, a post hardcore scene of the two thousands. Uh, you know there's going to be copycats everywhere uh it's just about th that doesn't give merit to everything that they do though you know what i mean i feel like this song is good but it is not great absolutely and i i, I agree with you there and i'm gonna i think it's a great song but i don't think it's the song that should have been in no time to die. what do you think should have been there i think there's not a song in particular that I think should have gone there because obviously, well, I don't know. I really would have hoped that instead of having, for the past three Bond films now, we have had the sad, somber piano melody. Huge pop oh, stars. Life is depressing. You were my everything. I want to kill myself. Let this be over. Which was fantastic with Fidel and Skyfall, and she emulated those 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 feelings beautifully. What what I loved about that was the jazzy music underneath that. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah, it's so good. Dun, 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 Love that. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> she, she 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 brought it home, and then with Sam Mendes, it was similar. Dun, like it was again, dun, dun. piano and you know, soft voice, and, you know, lots of falsetto. And then again with Billie Eilish, we got "Sleepy Lullaby Time" bed, uh, lullaby bedtime, starring Billie Eilish. <laughs> we have the main melody. It, it, it's a piano again, and it's it's sad chords, and it's like, "Oh, regret! Oh, woe is me! Oh, I was betrayed once again." I feel like for this No Time to Die film, there should have been something a lot more powerful. And and not, I mean, obviously No Time to Die could be powerful, but more bombastic and more electric. Something like a Chris Cornell, you know my name. He was Something already dead, like but yes. 
Something you know would have been bad. perfect. You know who would have been like a great, uh, perfect thing to do here? What? You could have easily gotten the Foo Fighters to do this. Yeah. I say so. You get, know, get like a, a rock ballad. Jack, you could have had Jack White come back. Yeah. Get like a true send off, like a true, you know, energetic. Or even to that extent, you know who's not doing anything right now? And I just mentioned a few moments ago, Gerard Way. You could have very easily had My Chemical Romance put together something. Yeah. And I don't think it would have been an issue at all. But Billie Ash is up and coming. She's the youngest ever to do this and the youngest ever to do that. And that's amazing. Listen, listen congratulations. There were so many good songs that came out last year that could have won this award or been nominated for this award. Yes. In I fact, do. I'm going to do something that I normally sh- wouldn't or shouldn't do. I'm going to go ahead and start listing some of these. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to start putting those two. Yeah, but I really think like it would have fit the tone of the, of the, of the film better if, if it had like that energetic, bombastic send-off uh, theme that we so desperately needed. But... Um, we got no time to die, and it's it's all right. It's a good it's a good place. It's the safe it's the safe choice. I mean, and, but but honestly, but honestly, that song from Four Good Days is terrible. I don't like that Diane Warren song, and I didn't like Four Good Days when I saw it at Sundance in twenty nineteen. I mean, we could say that this year's Oscars was the safe pick Oscars. Uh yeah. I mean, yeah, that's that's pretty true. Yeah. I mean. In fact, I have the short list right here. I have the 15 songs that were on the short list. You have right. your you have Diane Warren, obviously. You had Reba McIntyre, somehow you do that, that was nominated. Down to Joy by Ben Morrison, that was nominated. Your song, Save My Life by U2, which is not a great song. Dream Girl from the Cinderella movie, which is terrible. Why? Just Look Up by Ariana Grande and uh <laughs> Kid Cudi. That would have been funny if that was nominated. That would have been right? nominated. Here I am. Uh, from Respect. Anonymous ones from Dear Evan Hansen. Say what you will about the Dear Evan Hansen movie, and I have said a lot of disparaging things about <laughs> the Dear Evan Hansen movie. Oh, man. Most of them revolving around the fact that it's, it's nepotism the film, and it's awful. The Anonymous ones was a nice addition to the film, even though they cut out some good songs. Beyond the Shore from Coda. What the fuck are you guys doing? <laughs> so that's I not think... nominated. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> I loved Coda. I just saw it a couple weeks ago. I loved so. Coda. I loved it. I Brian Brought Along with Brian from Brian Wilson. Dos yeah. Orillitas, uh, obviously was nominated. Be Alive, nominated. Guns Go Bang by Kid Cudi from The Heart of They Fall. If you guys haven't seen The Heart of They Fall on Netflix, that movie fucking rocks, dude. Is that the Western with uh, Lakeisha? Yeah. yeah. It's amazing. I have to check that out. Dude, Lakeisha- it's yeah. it's that so good. Um, the guy from the uh, last black man in San Francisco is also in it. Oh shit! Um, what's his name? I forget his name. I don't remember his name, but I know I know I know that. You know what I'm talking about, though. I do. And um, also, uh, my boy from Me and Earl and the Dying Girl and the upcoming Emergency is also in it. Um, what's his name? R.J. Siler, and he's probably my favorite character in the whole movie. I love R.J. Siler, and I can't wait for you guys to see Emergency when it comes out in May. I saw it at Sundance, and I'm probably gonna work the junket next month. Can't wait for you guys to see that. Automatic Woman by Her. Her would have have be a two time nominee. Uh, so so may we start uh, from the movie Annette, which, dude, it's what you didn't nominate Sparks. You had the shot to nominate yeah. Sparks. It was a uh, yeah, and you didn't do it. My boys from sparks ron and russell deserve their flowers for this song and and for even making it happen because if you watch the sparks documentary that uh that came out last year um it's amazing um and actually they they re- i want to thank those guys for retweeting our tweet back at Tri- south by when we, the movie came when we saw the movie Fuck yeah. um i want to i want to say they talk about the fact that, that that russell and ron have been working on a musical for like 10 years and then we see it manifest itself later in, on in that year at the same time that that Sparks documentary came out. And um, Edgar Wright directed that Sparks documentary, by the way. It's fucking good. It's on Netflix. It's really good. 
Um, but Annette is such a breath, uh, a, fre- a breath of fresh air, you know. And it's sad that we didn't uh, also nominate the song from Cyrano, which was directed by. Uh, I'm sorry, which was written by, uh, what's that band called? I, remember, I don't remember the band. Uh, what is that band called? I'm spacing on that indie band that wrote the songs for Cyrano. I can't really recall. I'm going to look this up because now I'm upset. He's upset, ladies and gentlemen. You cannot find the damn band. I cannot figure out this band uh, that did the music for that movie and although have you guys if you guys haven't seen Cyrano it's pretty pretty good oh the national that's right the national Le National that's the band I'm talking about the national uh they have some great some great tracks but I couldn't remember their name for the life of me um but yeah that's that's it you know I mean you, you nominated No Time to Die at one and we we're on that slippery slope now and I don't think we're going to be able to recover yes and and looking to the future of Bonds who do you think should play the next chain? If you want my honest opinion, I would have loved to have seen, uh, you know, back in the day, I would have loved to have seen um, Idris Elba. Oh, yeah. But at this point, I don't see that happening. Uh, David Ayelowo, also too old now, would have been good. He's, you know, he's a suave, sophisticated fella. Um, But if they have to be British and they have to exist, I think we're going to, I'm thinking I'm going to take our boy. Mr. uh, He's only 38. Yep. Andrew Garfield. Think... Oh, really? Yeah, I didn't think of that. He's British what? and he's only 38. I mean, I could, you know, I really feel like you could pop, you could do it. But I mean, he has he has bulked up for Spidey before. I'm used, I'm used to seeing him a little bit more wiry nowadays. But yeah, um, but you put him in a suit. He he does look pretty good. I was gonna say Henry Cavill, but yeah, Henry Cavill's a good pick, but he's in everything. So yeah, I mean, I still have to see the man from Uncle. Ah, it's uh, it's great. It's it's a good time. It's a good time. I've I've heard rumors that Henry Cavill's gonna be in the production of one of my favorite video game series of all time, Mass Effect. Oh yeah, Mass Effect. I heard that he's going to be playing uh, Commander Shepard in Mass Effect, and as a Mass Effect stan, hardcore. I've beaten the game like ten times. Uh, sure. It's one of the few games on my PS4, PS5 that I have the Platinum Trophy on, the Legendary Edition. I've beaten that game and done every achievement. Damn. Uh, I That's, love Mass uh, Effect. It, oh, I will yeah, speak dude. its praises constantly. And if Henry Cavill's going to play Commander Shepard, okay. <laughs> okay. All I'm right. Okay with that. He's down. Right. Just be better than the Halo series. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, but Witcher's pretty good, so. Yeah, there's, there's, one, there's one video game adaptation that I – hope does not happen for a while because i want to do it it's um the legend of zelda which dude that's so big it's so big it'll be one of the hardest hardest adaptations ever done it's got to be so long <laughs> it does There's so much story it does it has to be like a uh, freaking lord of the rings it's gonna be another lord of the rings it's, it's gonna so long there's so much story there you know where you so start there you know? story. there's I have so many ideas. I have I lost my know. mind. Well, I'm not even, I'm a shell. That's, that's part of the reason why I'm so mumbly and bumbly nowadays. Who else, cause... who else do you think besides your good pick of Henry Cavill and my amazing pick of, uh, Garfield. of Garfield. Okay. So I, so, I did have my hair pot in, so I know exactly what you're about to say. And I hate you. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> don't you yeah. don't you fucking say it <laughs> if that guy gets the role i'm gonna punch someone yeah did you see that interview where he's with henry cavill and he's like oh i've heard that people like me to play james bond henry cavill's like yes yes people have been telling me that i should be james bond and tom holland's like hey hey, hey what about me <laughs> <And it's> like, <laughs> no i love the guy i love his charisma but he's too young. He's too and young. Drake was terrible. Nathan Drake and was terrible. I can I can imagine you're a diehard Uncharted fan. I do love me some Uncharted, my friend. Yeah, that, that could have been the next Indiana Jones, but you know. I went ahead and just looked up British actors. And Cumberbatch. 
Cumberbatch is on the list. He's a little old. He looks a bit. Uh, yeah. I mean, he's Hiddleston. already. Hiddleston's a good one. Yes. McAvoy. McAvoy. Fassbender. He's on Fassbender. Fish, but... He's yeah. Irish. That counts. Yeah. Okay. Wouldn't uh, be the first time we've had an Irish, you know. Would not be the first time. Uh, Anthony right. Hopkins. He's Why not? Old. No, no. He's not too old. Let's give him a Logan type James Bond. Nicholas Holt. Nicholas Holt. That's a good one. He is a good one. He would be the younger James Bond, though, because that guy is still in his mid-20s. I I think he's actually 34. Yeah, but I know, but he looks like he's in his early to mid-20s. He he will for the next 10 years. Yeah. Which is fantastic. Found of youth. Get Paul Rudd to play James Bond. Nicholas Holt is 32 years old. That's not very old. That's not very old. See, the thing is with Bond is that they can go one of two ways. And... I do not understand why people were saying, well, James Bond is dead. How are they going to continue the films? Like, they kind of missed the point of it. Mm-hmm. But um, I understand that casual moviegoer brain is something I cope with daily. That's, the most, film, that. that's, that's the most film snobby thing I've ever said. So well, That's the perfect place to do it. Perfect. Um, they can have, again, they can have, you know, the safe pick, which is the older James Bond, do like a couple movies with one actor and then move to the other and do that way. Or they can go with the young trainee Bond and do it that way. We haven't explored that. We have not explored that. And it would be fun. It would be like, I don't want to say this, but I mean, it's a good comparison to make. Kingsman, first film. It's very fun. It's very all over the place. James Bond probably wouldn't be as graphic or, uh, you know, hard hitting, like not a hard of, as hard of an R as Kingsman was, but I feel like it'd be really fun. I feel like it'd be, it'd be, it'd be, you know, it's, it's James training. And I like that. His first mission. And, and if not Lashana Lynch as the female Bond, who would you pick? I'd have a, Solo series with Ana de Armas Paloma. I like it. Like, I'd go down that road because she knocked it out of the park. She's great. I mean, I can't, I cannot wait to see uh, Blonde, which is that Marilyn Monroe biopic that she's. Oh, it's going to be so good. She's, it's going to, I don't even know what, I I can't even handle what the reaction is going to be like. She's, everybody knows her for having like that slight Cuban accent. And then out of nowhere, she's going to have this. I, I'm just not even, I'm this mid Atlantic type uh, accent that is very popular among the actors at that time. And she's going to be having that because that's what Marilyn sounded like. She had that like mid Atlantic, but with a breathiness to it. Yes. Um, I think Michelle Williams did a good job of kind of nailing it. She was, that, oh, yeah, that movie's, sure. you know, okay. It's a, good, it's a good film. But to our second topic of the day, and I thought this was a good topic, and that's why I wanted to include this as well. Oh. Um, but uh, before we do that, I wanted to uh, show the audience a small little clip from my interview with Karen Sony and Roshan Seth, and Rohan Sethi, director and both both of them are writers, the director and star of the movie Seven Days, which just came out. If you guys don't know who Karen Sony is, he was a uh, uh, dope pinder in Deadpool. Oh, um, and I got a chance to interview oh. them about the new movie. Here's a small clip. You guys can check out the rest on YouTube. So positively spirited and so beautifully put together. And I loved the chemistry be- between both yourself, Karin, and uh, Geraldine Vishwanathan. I, I know I said that one right. Uh, yes. <laughs> you know, uh, between the two of you guys. And it just works so well for me. You're such a dweeb in this movie, and I loved your character. Can you guys describe <laughs> writing that character and how much of that is you guys and how much of that is uh, just trying to craft, craft a character? Uh, it was a very heightened version of like um, us when we first met, um, me and Roshan, because um, I was quite uh, thirsty and quite uh, dweeby, like you said. Um, and then, you know, we just like spice it up for the movie to just uh, make him a little bit more of that. Uh, and it's always really, really fun to play and act uh, like, uh, like that kind of character. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Hope you guys enjoyed that little small clip. 
check out the rest of the interview on YouTube. Our second topic of the day, I thought this was a great topic that James brought to me, and it is best trailers, like of all time. Yeah. There's this a... Is a weighted category right here. This is a weighted discussion. Let me ask you, what is your favorite trailer of all time? That is like asking a soccer player what their favorite soccer ball is. Sir, most of most soccer balls are pretty much the same. I am a soccer player. I know, but like it's it, that was a terrible metaphor. Just because you're not going to cut it out, but I, I, I look so dumb. I'm uh, going to let you look dumb because. <laughs> okay, that was, uh, oh my God. That was you sound dumb, James. You sound real dumb. So, um, yeah. Nick fucking. I didn't say that. Okay. <laughs> I'm Nick fucking okay. kid. By the way, I've seen the movie. I can't say anything about it. Okay. Yeah. I, I can't wait to see it. So, best trailers. There are a great many. The one I always rewatch, and this is like a monthly thing. It's like a tradition I have now. And it never it never ceases to instill this just this echoing feeling of nostalgia and bittersweetness. It's a trailer for the self and one. I was just gonna bring that one up. It's such a great trailer, man. Dude, it's good pick. It's just so fantastic. And it really is. I, I wrote a whole essay on it on how, how like the k- lyrics relate to the characters and how it's edited together and how they put so much effort into the trailer almost as much as they did into the, into the final film. And I love the choice of music. I love the, the buildup and what it accomplishes and it's very short, like almost two minute duration. And it evokes this sense of, you know, like we're never really going to see the beginning of a new technological wave like Facebook or, or like, you know, like a biopic of that, like ever again. Like, I, it's a strange feeling. Like, you watch it and you're instantly transported back to your clunky desktop computer in 2010 watching a 720p trailer on the old YouTube that was gray and like not owned by Google. It's... Yeah. It yeah. stands on its own that way. Like, it's really amazing. And um, it's just one of the best films of the decade also. But I'll tell really you, the effective. funny thing is, it's probably not even the best film that came out, that trailer that came out that year. Oh, yeah. Okay, I know. Go ahead. Bomb. Bum, 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 bum. The trendsetter. The trend. Inception's setter. trailer is fucking amazing. It is nuts. That Let trailer- me tell you how good this is. Story time. Yes. All right. That trailer came on, and the mother of my son <clears throat> and I were still together at the time. She sees the trailer, and she has no interest in these sort of movies. She's like, I want to see that, and I want to see it the day it comes out. That's how you know you've made a good trailer. You sold it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's oh, – it's, it, it is very, very – the theme, I love it in trailers when, when, when themes swell at the end and it's not just, you know, I don't know. Like, I love it when there's specific pieces written for trailers also. And it's yeah. not just like... A pop song I know, slowed down? Yeah. It seems to be now, a trend. I mean, the social network trailer started that and it's the best one to do it, I think. Uh, it is. Maybe for the Spencer trailer, I did like the it's the same band as the social network. Um, it did work. Spencer's did work. Um, but Inception was really fantastic. That tra- that, that trailer was 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 yeah. really great. And that theme song has been used countless times in other areas. I will say it's not my favorite trailer though of all time. I, I can yes. tell you another story here. I remember being about 12 years old yes. going to the movie theater in 1999 and a trailer played for the Matrix oh. and I was like can they, they can do that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah that must have been that must have been crazy my mind was blown man 
My mind was blown, man. I can't even explain to you the cultural tomfoolery going with my head when I saw the trailer for The Matrix. I was like, they can do this. It had like that techno, like prodigy sounding music playing underneath. Slapping. Yeah, and I was like, what the fuck? (laughs) I was like 12. I was like, I don't know what I just saw, but I want to see that movie. Rated R. Damn it. Damn it. Son of a bitch. Matrix. Still ended up seeing it yeah. anyway, because it's amazing. And the funny thing is my computer class in high school, so this is like two years later, after I'd already seen the movie, but two years later, we studied the Matrix in computer class as a discussion on how computer animation and digital photography had advanced in the, in the previous two years. Yeah. Oh, I've had a great many information technology, the Matrix discussions. I watched that in high school, too. Such uh, a great film. That trailer is so good. It is so good. To give you another modern example, though, M- Mad Max Fury Road. It is a, it's a good trailer. I like that trailer. That's a great trailer. I, I just think it's so good. And, um, you know, then there's Spider-Man. Raimi's first Spider-Man. The first one. Yeah. I really like the third one. Trailer. Was, yeah. Two. Yeah, too bad that movie's not any good. And then what 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 comes to mind when I say the words I got five on it? Oh, is that the uh, the us yep. trailer? Yep. Now that's a good trailer. It is a good trailer. That is it's a really good trailer. That's a great yeah. trailer. Jordan Peele's trailers have always been really yeah uh, yeah because the one for serious. yeah even his new new trailer is really good. Yeah, he, he's he knows how to pull that off. Okay, um, the nineties had some incredible ones though. Yeah, I'm. I'm. Do tell about the '90s ones. Terminator Two, Judgment Day, incredible trailer. Incredible. Movie. Um, if you've never seen Pulp Fiction's trailer, it's really good. Goldeneye, we talked about it earlier. Great trailer. Hold on. Strange yeah. Days, the Catherine Bigelow film. I haven't seen it. Great fucking trailer. Um, Independence Day's trailer, good. The Got Ninety Eight Godzilla, a great trailer. Not a great movie. I'll talk about another Godzilla trailer. The Gareth Edwards directed movie. That's a good trailer. That you see all those red, that red fan. smoke. Oh, it's a fucking fantastic. Goosebumps. Trailer. Good, I'm good. Just pick. Goosebumps. But no, you know what's funny? Is... 1999 had another fantastic trailer in it. The Blair Witch Project. Oh my god, that's right. That came out that year. 99 is one of the best years for cinema ever. Yeah, it was. It was quite ever. Yeah. Ever. All you have to do, and I'm going to do it right now. <laughs> is Google 1999 movies? Yeah, and there are iconic movies. I'll accompany you, you thing. with that. Let's see, 1999. American Beauty, Magnolia, Fight Club, Virgin Suicides, Ten Things I Hate About You, Cruel Intentions, Girl Interrupted, Big Daddy, She's All That, Eyes Wide Shut, Bar City Blues, The Thomas Crown Affair, Man on the Moon, October Sky, Notting Hill, Jawbreaker, Jesus. Being John Malkovich, American Pie, The Straight Story. Blair Witch Project, Stir of Echoes, The Matrix, Analyze This. I can Star keep going. Wars. Sixth the Sense, Menace. Drive Me Crazy, Green Mile, Boondock Saints, Never Been Kissed, Sleepy Hollow, Audition, if you like Asian cinema. Star Wars. Star Wars. Don't let's not talk about that. <laughs> Depressing ass movie. <laughs> God damn it. Why'd you have to ruin my momentum? <laughs> I was on a fucking roll, man. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. The Iron well, Giant well, Galaxy Quest. I'm going to yeah. keep going just because you were a dick. <laughs> <laughs> Austin Powers, the spy who shagged me. Shagged me. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, but yeah, and then there's the most recent movie trailers have been the best ones. There's um, so many good ones now there's the, because there's of the, the way that they pick, do it. Um, which is the Alien trailer. The original Alien. That's a really good one. Jaws is also good. The original Jaws. Yes. Really, really great. Um, there's another one. I, I Superman can't... 1. The trailer starts out with, you will believe a man can fly. Da, ba, da, ba. Uh, that, yeah, that yeah. John Williams score plays. Yes. Amazing trailer. And that's from the 70s. Exactly. And from the 70s, when trailers were like three minutes long and they told you the entire movie. It's crazy. And... Um, yeah, so in, in, in recent years, there's that social network one. Really hype, 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 hype trailer. 
was the Force Awakens trailer. Um, the one where Han and Chewie appear at the very end. That Chewie, one. We're home. We're home. Like, it was... <laughs> I watched that clip at Celebration 2014 or 2015. I don't remember what it was. A few times, like, every every, every year. Just to Guys, he's his- outing himself as a Star Wars nerd. Yes. What do you think? Because I'm about to mention a couple other trailers that are really good also. Um, that take place within Star Wars. Um, actually, no, no, no. The Force Awakens trailer was like the really only Star Wars trailer that really impacted me. Because um, mm-hmm. that was like the perfect mix of nostalgia, which that film is great. You know, for. And it's unfortunately uh, it's it's unknown for because it's you know a carbon copy of the new hope. Unfortunately. But it had been a while since we'd had a last Star Wars film and having the princess and Hans theme na, 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 throughout the whole trailer. And it goes into the front da, 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 and it goes like into that. Um that trailer was really great. And then for the Han and Chewie were home. That trailer theme has been used in countless other Star Wars projects because it's due to how freaking great it is. It starts out with like this single piano note and it goes like building in tension with like violins. And um, then it just explodes in like the last minute. Um, and it's just fantastic. Um, it goes like, duh, 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 and it goes, bah, bah, and it goes into that variation of Yoda's theme um, when Luke lifts the X one. It's like, but 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 it's like so great. It so, is so great. <laughs> it, it's so fantastic. But he's he's I, outed but, himself, ladies and gentlemen. I know I'm out of myself. Um, I will say the best trailer I have ever seen in history of any medium, of any TV show, of any movie, any video game, is the story trailer for The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. That is probably the best trailer you will ever witness. It doesn't matter if you're like, oh, I don't like Zelda, or oh, I don't like this. You will watch it, and you will want to know what First happens. of all, who doesn't like Zelda? My favorite video game of all time is Ocarina of Time. Bingo. There you go. That freaking trailer. If you're listening right now, just go pause and watch it and come back. We'll be here. The Breath of the Wild trailer is good. It's too bad the Breath of the Wild came out on the Switch. Yes. A system not capable of fully handling what, what that game put forth. And the Wii U. <clears throat> but we won't. I have a Wii U, actually. Oh. Well, there you go. You can get it. <laughs> I have a Wii U. It, 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 that, the Wii U deserved better. <laughs> it does have a. It actually is the closest thing of getting all the Zelda games on the console. Though, so I will give you that. Nah, uh, you can get them all on Switch now. You can't get Wind Waker or Twilight Princess. You can get Wind Waker Remake HD, baby. On it's Wii U, game. it's the same game. <laughs> hey, I, yeah, I know what you mean. I like Wind Waker though. But yeah, so that trailer for freaking Breath of the Wild, the Wild it's just so great. It's the, the theme, it's something you can't put into words. And I can't describe it into words. So you're just going to have to go and see it because I know that's, like, that's an easy way out, but it's just fantastic. It's, it shows what a trailer can do by showing tidbits of a story that have the intriguing plot points set up in a way that, that make you want to, you know, see the rest. It's like the, the, it's the appetizer for, for the whole thing, right? It's the, it's, it's the, it's that the, it's the tip of the cake that you eat before you get to like into the three layers, like that little bit of like brownie fudge that comes off. You know, like oh well, I might as well just gobble this before having the rest of it. Like it's fantabulous. It so is I, good I, stuff. I, I will say that I, I really enjoy that trailer, and it got me hyped to buy it, to play that game. And yeah, it's hard. It's hard to do that. It's hard to get me motivated to play a modern Nintendo game because I just think that they rehash all their shit. They do, unfortunately. Yeah, at at some but point, Zelda's the only series trying any with any sort of you know effort in it. Well, they did delay the sequel for another year because That's okay. not, that means they're going to put more work into it. They're just going to put yeah, and everybody's like, yeah, I want to play Zelda too. And it's like, no, dude, you're going to get something so much better next year. Yeah, just wait another yeah. ten months. 
just wait and it it'll it'll manifest itself because they just pushed back the mass effect sequel too because ah. there's gonna be a fourth mass effect game in the proper series not andromeda we don't talk about andromeda um and they're pushing it back um and i'm okay with that because i'm like i'm like just let's just that's fine we can push it back we don't talk about rider no 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 we don't talk about rider uh <laughs> I, I love I love that I love that you would have been you would have been good to have on our video game movies discussion that me and Shay had about last year. Yeah, that's that's the Super Mario Brothers movie is one of my guilty pleasures. Never mind, you would have been terrible because we we basically threw flames at that movie for an hour. But it's fine. I don't care. It's just funny because because just solely because of Bob Hopkins is Mario. It's it, an it, awful movie. What do you mean <laughs> we're not gonna go to WrestleMania? <laughs> Oh, Pauline, I'm gonna take you to WrestleMania. I want my tap water. I hate, I hate that movie so much. <laughs> he's, he's so great. Um, I hate it, ladies and gentlemen. That's our episode this 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 yeah, month. Thanks for we, we'd love to thank you guys for listening to us, James. If they want to follow you on social media, where would they do this? I'll be uh, James Thomas Snyder, James Elos Frames, James Snyder, James Elos Frames. You can put the latter version and not the former version because this technically takes place before I changed the name. So yeah, you can follow me there and you can direct your attention to Will. Who is well, I, love, I love the name James E. Lost Frames. You should never change that, but you are. I, I will never change James E. Lost Frames. Um, Will's really done a fantastic good. job of hosting me today. As, as muddle as my may, brain may be sometimes, I think he... He did a good job, guys. Tell him he did a great job. Let him know. Guys, of course, I am Will William from Film Snobby Views. You can follow me everywhere. Everywhere. Face, Facebook, Instagram, All at once. Twitter, Twitch, everywhere. At Film Snob Reviews. I'm always, you know, I'm always on Twitch playing something. I'm always on Facebook complaining about something. And I'm always on Twitter yelling about something. You guys are more than welcome to follow me there. And... Of course, we're hopeful next month that we can have Shay back on because she's an insane person and she keeps me balanced. And of course, Chaotic. James, you're going to be coming back too next month. Hopefully, I if you're not busy, uh, elbow deep to. in some filming or something I, like that. Once again, I hope to be, be in both. You know, I mean, there you go. See, th- 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 that's this month's snobcast. And once again, we will see you next time. <laughs>